All right, here we go. Very happy to have another young Indian with us today, as usual, smiling happily. Uh, right now we have with us Diksha Pandey. Let's listen to her. Over to you, Diksha. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mathur, for giving me this opportunity to speak about myself and about my work. So um, I'm Diksha Pandey. Uh, I'm an associate fellow at the Global Climate and Development Institute at Suniti Initiative. Um, as for my background, I have a master's in development economics from the University of Sussex um, and a bachelor's in economics honors from uh, Christ University. Um, after my uh, post-graduation, um, I have been involved in different development-centric uh, centric projects in different institutes, um, such as the Institute of Development Studies, Institute of Economic Growth, so on and so forth. Um, but in 2021, I was uh, fortunate enough to shift to a completely new field, which is the energy transition um, field. And I say that I was fortunate because at that time, the energy transition discourse in India was really picking up. Um, researchers, academicians, uh, public policy experts were uh, picking up on especially the sub-national picture of the transition. So I was luckily drawn into that field. And ever since then, I've been researching um, the whole uh, energy transition um, uh, discourse. And this is what I want to discuss um, briefly with you um, uh, today. and. Uh, I want to start by sort of giving a picture of what the scenario is today, as it stands today in India. Uh, I'll be very um, India specific in this con conversation because that's where um, I've worked and where my expertise also lies. So right now, if you look um, in India, we understand what energy transition means. We understand uh, who will be impacted by energy transition. We also understand the broad timeline of coal phase down, phase out, because there have been several assessments uh, uh, carried out in different studies that uh, you know give a picture of the phase down scenario. So this is all we understand. But what what we don't understand, what the bleak understanding of is, what's next? What are the alternatives? what happens when you know the fossil fuel dependency declines so that is where my research interests also lie and i've been constantly and thoroughly involved in um, researching uh, this topic and <clears throat> if you ask me um, there is no one size fits all approach to this uh, thing there is no silver bullet to this problem but if i have to say you know if i have to give one solution i would say that that is economic diversification. So um, <clears throat> for those who um, are new to this term, economic diversification, it means um, it is a long sort of long thought strategy of, you know, shifting away from one resource dependency. So in Indian context, we can see this as a way, as a socioeconomic strategy of mitigating that impact that is going to happen when the transition happens. So, <clears throat> I mean, I've been researching um, in, in this area and have studied several, luckily I've studied several regions. And I genuinely feel that this is, um, you know, this approach will fit India because um, I, I see it as an opportunity, as an opportunity of growth. Because if you see, uh, you know, worldwide, Countries have diversified. Countries have diversified from a single resource, whether you talk about Germany, the German coal, or the rural area, <clears throat> or you talk about the whole oil scenario with Norway. Countries have diversified and they've grown. So I see it as an opportunity that will help, you know, that will push India towards, you know, achieving its um, net zero goals and creating more employment opportunities. <clears throat> and uh, <sighs> And I mean, but there are several challenges to it. It's not easy. Um, and the first challenge that I would say is that nobody's talking about it yeah. in Indian context. Um, and I mean, slowly people have started to understand what the transition is. But like I said, solutions are limited. Solutions are not um, properly understood. 
the whole you know the dual agenda of economic development and decarbonization has been a debate in academia for long but in practice it's very poorly understood so my focus here is to you know uh, give a policy push in terms of what the solutions would be <clears throat> yeah okay well, it's a very ambitious agenda of that you have for yourself um, yeah. as you rightly say it is not debated it's not understood uh, what you are saying and i would love to hear what it is mm -hmm. so i'm thinking and from the research that we're doing it is a solution but what we do need is sort of a framework for it to work so in a framework there will be several elements to the whole diversification bit so if i can broadly talk about the framework <clears throat> in my understanding the framework can would entail a lot of different elements um and i would specify uh, five of them right here okay um <clears throat> the first one being the institutionalization of diversification plans so when at the national subnational or even regional level what is the first push for a scheme the administration takes you know cognizance that you know certain um, that this has to be done and then they put it put a plan in practice so even at the national level if we agree that diversification is needed and we put uh, diversification plans uh, in the national plans it would be a great help a great push for the agenda now institutional institutionalization also means that we bring together <clears throat> several stakeholders as we know energy transition you know has different stakeholders it has communities it has administrative staff it has labor unions um it has obviously uh, the coal sector employees so through institutionalization we are also bringing together a lot of different stakeholders so that for me would be the first agenda that we can you know sort of um, have if you're talking about economic diversification or shifting away from coal or a sing single use um, dependency then <clears throat> as we know and i'm sure many of us would agree that coal dependent regions have very poor socio economic parameters whether it's um, you know literacy literacy whether it's uh, dependence on electricity whether it's medical uh, facilities they're very poor areas so the socio economic parameters are very low and economic diversification means that you need to bring investments you know to to that place you need foreign investments and foreign investments will come when you have infrastructure in place physical infrastructure is immensely important for diversification so i definitely think the second <clears throat> and most important point is the infrastructure bit and um the governments regional national subnational should really work on the infrastructure development of these coal uh, dependent areas connected to that is investment in um human capabilities and and i'm talking um because these regions have such low socio economic parameters the people um who are employed in the sector in the coal sector are and especially i'm talking about the informal economy they they're not employable they have really low skill they are not educated so what would you do to so that this set of people become employable you know yeah. how do you develop th their capabilities so mm. that is another point that we really um need to fo focus on then the so we've talked about <laughs> institutionalization we've talked talked about um you know investing in uh, physical infrastructure yeah. about mm. human um uh, capital development now the fourth point that i want to focus on is third mm. third that's the third or oh, that was yeah. the third the, the human capital was the third yeah. that was right. the third physical capital and human capital okay yeah, yeah. Right. i'm so separating so let's go to the yeah. fourth yeah. yeah the fourth point that i really want to focus on is developing um if i can say comparative you know tapping into the comparative advantage <clears throat> of a region and this is very important for diversification because you have those abilities in 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 that region so why not tap into that potential and diversify 
So if I can give you um, an example of say, Pedapali. Pedapali is the small um, district in, in, in the southern, uh, South Indian state of uh, uh, Telangana. It's heavily coal dependent, but, is, but it also has 61% uh, rural uh, population and it is heavily dependent on agriculture. And when Perapali was formed in 2016, it was, you know, it has, it had ambitions of becoming the seed bowl of India because of the massive uh, grain production and agricultural production and so on and so forth. So why not tap into that sector, which is not coal and, you know, become advantageous in that, in, in that sense. So tapping tapping into the uh, local uh, you know uh, competencies and comparing comparative advantages become very essential for uh, economic diversification now the fifth and the most important part is the financial capabilities i mean financial uh, help is indispensable for diversification like i said <clears throat> Uh, I'll, I'll give you again the example of the Norwegian fund, Norwegian pension fund, which was, which reinvested uh, the the, the, uh, uh, the oil funds into different sectors, whether it was uh, renewables or tourism, um, so on and so forth. So it actually diversified the economy using um, the funds that came from the fossil fuel uh, resource. So I think. That way, it becomes very essential to, uh, you know, think about building financial capabilities. Some countries are also looking at JetPs, you know, taking external help from multinational institutions in other countries so that they have enough uh, funds to, you know, sort of plan for this transition. But in any case, those financial uh, capabilities become very important for diversification as well. So... From my understanding, these five elements are very crucial, very essential for making an economy diversified and shifting away from you know, dependency of one resource. Um, I'm still researching on this topic and uh, right now we're trying to understand the whole diversification bit at the subnational level. So, you know, instead of having one big plan for India, like I said, there's no one size it's all approach. We're trying to understand if this diversification um, approach can fit into one small region. And <clears throat> we're doing that through surveys, you know, getting data through primary surveys and focus group uh, discussions and semi-structured interviews. And we're trying to understand um, in what sectors can a region heavily dependent on coal diversify into. And Another thing that we're uh, that we're very interested in understanding is what are the aspirations of the people, because if a region has to diversify, um, the aspirations of the people become very essential. If, for example, people um, are interested in um, say manufacturing, they have those uh, you know aspirations, and why not have industries that you know. Uh, manufacturing industries in place. Why not invest on, in those? So this is one essential component that we try to capture through our um, um, you know, primary surveys. And we want to put that uh, into practice, put that as a policy, because then the whole approach becomes a bottom-up bottom approach. Because we're listening to the voices from the ground, we're taking into their, uh, taking into consideration their um, you know, views and perspectives, and then pushing for this policy change. <clears throat> yeah okay uh, if you want a reaction from me i must say that it's a very critical piece of thinking that you are doing it's not yet a plan you're not planning you are thinking researching getting the data it's a very critical part i think one reason nobody talks about it is because they think we are not going to get away from coal there's yeah. a hidden agenda that, okay, all this is talk. We will be in coal. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if you are not going to be in coal, then I think what you are doing and what you are thinking about is very important. Okay. This is not something that's going to not come to haunt us. And as you noted, of course, uh, Telangana, I've can't pronounce the name of this district that you're talking about. Pedipalli, Pedipalli yes. is prosperous. 
But if you look at Jharkhand, Odisha, and Bihar, and all the coal belt, as you rightly pointed out, they're very poor. And the incomes mm -hmm. are low, and nobody is going to go there with the FDI. It's impossible. You know, FDI is only in a few states. And even in the mm -hmm. states, it's in a few districts of those states. I saw somewhere a figure that there are 16 districts in India whose uh, GDP approximately is the equal to another 690 districts. So the mm -hmm. geographical inequality is very much there. <laughs> and these places are company towns in Jharkhand, Bihar, yeah. all these. They're company towns. And if the company goes, the town goes. Yeah, exactly. As simple as that. And we have to prepare for what is the alternative for these people because we can't think of coal as a fuel. Only coal is also a source of livelihood, which is what True. you are stressing, that it is a source of livelihood for the coal miners and the families that are there. Though they are poorly paid, they are suffering uh, you know, diseases arising from exposure to coal and the pollutants. Yet this is their best option, given the history, culture, whatever. So it's a major disruptive change. And, you, you know, as you know, the coal towns of U.S. became ghost towns. Yes. And even the, you know, I know recently there's a copper town, as, since you mentioned Norway, uh, there is mm -hmm. a copper town of Norway that is now a ghost town. Nicely preserved, it's a tourist place. But these mm -hmm. mineral oriented cities and towns they tend to become ghost towns yeah and if you can't can't afford to have a ghost regions as you rightly said because the whole re so i'm in full support uh for mm. what you are doing but i don't want to talk much here it's your turn to talk so please go ahead yeah so like you you rightly said that you know people don't don't say that you know People say that coal will not go away. And this is exactly what we get to hear from ground as well, because they can't think beyond coal. In, in, in areas like Ramgar, Bukaro, you know, so dependent on coal, they cannot think beyond coal. And that's where I think it's important for, uh, you know, well-known practitioners like us to push for that, to help people think and also, you know, get their aspirations, capture their aspirations also. So it, when we go on field, we try to, you know, sort of nudge them and give them a set of options as to what sectors they would want to work on. And we try to make them think beyond coal. But it, it, it's a very, um, you know, sort of sorry scenario. And, you know, it, it, they, they know that this is not going away. So they're not able to you know, think in that direction. But <clears throat> right now, I, I think we're focusing more on these solutions because, like I said, We've res researched enough into what it means and who will be impacted. And now it's time to put in practice what we've researched. You know, get get those pilot projects going that we've, you know, done at the sub national level and have at least one model uh, for, you know, an example for, you know, uh, energy transition. So that is the aim. And um and I'm sure uh, with the whole global scenario and all the, you know, all the research going on, this will be the case that, you know, um, <clears throat> we will be able to put one example uh, uh, forward that, you know, this is how we can move forward. And um, that's, that's, that's what we want. Um, I also feel that, that from the research perspective and uh, from the perspective in, in the policy uh, sector, there's, there needs to be subnational studies, a lot of subnational studies. And I say this because every region is so different. Telangana is so different from Jharkhand in terms of, again, socioeconomic para parameters, the political economy, the mindset of the people. So every region needs to be studied in a different way. So I definitely think that there has to be many, many more there should be many more studies, such studies that will, you know, bring out the truth. And we can study only so much, but we need, um, you know, more support that way. Okay, it's a wonderful long-term plan. You know, we can't be implemented in the short run, obviously. 
<clears throat> because coal is still there. And if you go in and say, oh, look, I've come here to diversify you away from coal, it's not <laughs> going to fly. <laughs> but you need to begin to think and you actually can begin to say, look, we are not here to move you away from coal, but some yeah. other selling point, you know, we are here to modernize you or whatever it is that mm -hmm. is locally appropriate. And yeah, we do that. Said, yeah, yeah, we do that because people are very sensitive and very emotionally attached to coal. So we can't directly say that you know coal is going away and we need to shift you. And we cannot. That is not the approach. We just try to understand what are the other things that they can do. What are the other skills that they have? They might have some intergenerational skills or you know some traditional skills that they can employ. So that way we sort of nudge, but we only nudge. A little not 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 so much to actually change their thinking mm -hmm. and uh, some people it, some of the fgds that we were part of are very very interesting because once you get the people talking they know the place they know what capabilities the place has so they give very innovative answers so <clears throat> for example we got um, you know uh, we were having this fgds and we uh, fgd and we had this um, discussion that how uh, you know rel religious tourism in ramgar can be a big source of uh, you know alternative employment and you know uh, having another sector in place um <clears throat> Several other, uh, you know, uh, sectors were mentioned, and in Pedapoli, for example, they said solar manufacturing can be one of the sectors. You know, schemes are there. Um, the government is also pushing uh, uh, for the sector. There's enough land, so why not have solar panels manufacturing? Um, so, on the ground, there are different perspectives. There's so many innovative ideas. So. The idea again is to bring those perspectives, those views on the table, and push for a policy reform. Okay. Uh, yeah. I want to make one suggestion, a very broad suggestion. Mm -hmm. That, you know, as you said, there is no home for your thinking. There's no academic home for your thinking. And you know, as people aren't talking about it, people aren't disc you are doing. Why don't you label it as part of adaptation? Mm -hmm. Because everybody in the climate change business talks about mitigation and mm -hmm. adaptation. Mm -hmm. Now, mitigation you are not looking at because mitigation means going away from coal. Adaptation people have usually understood it to mean, okay, there's going to be more rainfall and we are going to see what crops to grow, etc. You know what I'm talking about. Let's not waste time. But this is also adaptation. Definitely. Okay. So why don't you sell it or talk about it as a form of adaptation? Because that's a term that everybody knows. Mm. So then we can say, look, we have two types of adaptation that we need. One is adaptation to the physical impacts of climate change. Right. And the other is the economic impact of mitigation. Right. Yeah. Mitigation itself has negative economic impacts on certain regions and communities which are producing these fossil fuels and they have to adapt. So mm -hmm. I would, this is just on the spot thinking that adaptation, mm -hmm. if you put your thinking in the framework, as you said, you need a framework. I'm just trying mm -hmm. to give you an idea which is not thought through, which is spontaneous that it's a part of adaptation. If I were to label it, I would say it's a part of adaptation. Okay. That, yeah. You know, instead of look, thinking of adaptation as just, uh, you know, extreme heat, what do we do? Mm -hmm. Right? You say, okay, no coal, what do we do? Mm -hmm. It's adaptation. And I think there you will find easier to put a you know, you need a place to hang your coat on. <laughs> you aren't finding mm -hmm. a place, right? <laughs> but anyway, let me not say more. Maybe we can talk about it later. But that's my mm -hmm. suggestion. No, definitely. I think we have to sort of label it that way because it is an adaptive adaptation mechanism as well. We're not... And 
because we know that it's not going away in the next 20 30 even 40 years there needs to be adaptation first before totally you know uh, removing it so definitely i think that that, that would be a good pitch also for, for the people on the ground so that's something that i'm going to uh, take notice of and uh, okay. Fine. let me ask you my standard questions i have two of them what's your advice for young people tips okay. I mean, you um, went to sussex right uh, after yeah. your masters where was your after your bachelor's where was your bachelor's from i forget perhaps well, christ christ, christ right. so you went to sussex i'm sure young people would like to get some tips from you on how you went to christ and how you went to sussex so maybe we talk about it a bit i think um if 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 you ask me i think um to young people, I would say that be aware of what's going on. Like it's very important days age to be very well informed, very even very well connected, because that will help them know what they really want to do. And once that goal is clear, you you know how to navigate. So um, and this, if if I can advise this to myself, younger self also, I would say yeah, this. yeah, 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 yeah that. <laughs> you know, ha being that well informed, being knowledgeable about what you what your strengths are, what your capabilities are, it just makes it easier for you to uh, navigate your career path. So I think one of the things is that, and <clears throat> also um, talk to a lot of people, build connections because that gives you perspective from you know different people and just helps you uh, mold your thinking better. So I think these are the two things that uh, if I was younger, I would have told myself that too. That, you know, just be very well informed and very well connected and talk to more people. And what do you see as your future? I see myself in this field for a long time because uh, as a person who's study development economics, I, I, see as a, I see this as a huge development challenge and which will go on for a long time. So I see myself, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, working with international organizations and multilateral organizations in this um, sector to push for policy reforms. And hopefully that will yield, um, you know, positive outcomes as well. Wonderful. <laughs> Anything else you want to add here? Um, no, I think uh, this is, that's it okay. for my side. All right. Okay, cool. Let's end it here. Uh, yeah. I will be back with another young person or an expert soon. Yeah. Till then, bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you.